my treasures of gold. Things I see, things I hold, they steal my love and affection. They're bought and they're sold. They come and they go. They never.
Welcome to Chapel North. Welcome to the Lord's house and to worship with the rest of the body of Christ, wherever you may be. We've been called and gathered to worship this day in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our triune God. Will you join us in prayer? Father, may we walk in your ways, wanting nothing else than to be your children and to hold fast to the faith that you are with us through the storm and in the valley. Jesus, we ask that we would be caught up in your presence, that we would embrace this holy moment and that our hearts would desire nothing else but to be in worship with you now. Spirit, we invite you into this holy time of prayer, 
praise and focus. Do whatever you want to. God, may we be led into deeper love for our fellow man, stronger faith, and discerning hearts to hear the wisdom of your words and to apply it to our lives. Let's believe the words that you profess about us and our identity with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. From Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is it, it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. From there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. And from Matthew 25, 35 through 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. 
I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when, would, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? King will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And as we're in this series of generous justice, our hope and our prayer would be that we would be taught to say, Lord, whatever your will is, whatever your way is, let us be that same example of love to our brothers and sisters.
we continue in our time of worship, we have our trust and our faith to put out in this thing called the offering. And it's never something we do out of obligation or guilt, but always as an act of worship. Always as a moving forward of the kingdom. May we trust our God to the point that our faith is tested. May we be humbled and generous servants of his kingdom, obedient to his words, and soldiers to the namesake in all that we do. We pray together. Father, may our offerings of praise be pleasing to you. Further your kingdom here through us, we pray. Your will and your way be done through us, Jesus. Amen. presence
All throughout our sermon series on generous justice, we've done this song called Valley, a song that states that though it was never promised that the journey would be easy, it was promised that he would go with us. From Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. We may not be able to see it all, the whole picture. We have seen enough of Jesus and his generous justice to know he is faithful to his word and to his promises. May we too hold fast to that faith and to the example of Jesus and in his generous justice to others. Never said it would be easy. You never said there'd be no pain. But you promised you'd go with me, and your promises you always keep. Lord, I confess how much I need you. I confess that I am weak I can't promise I won't fail you But your promises will not fail me When I'm in the valley I will fear no evil When enemies surround me You prepare a table Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. There is beauty in the struggle. a single day but your presence is my shelter your presence is my victory oh when I'm in the valley I will fear no evil when enemies surround me
to know God, my prayer for us all today would be that we would lean into the discomfort, that we'd lean into the times of struggle and pain, because those are the ones that shape us, desiring instead for the fire of faith to burn with an intensity that requires complete trust, one without borders, and that your heart be one of like ours. That ours would be a heart like yours. And we would learn to say, your will, your way. Do whatever you want to. Father God, let your kingdom invade our hearts. Amen. Hey, Chapel North, it's Pastor Wood here again with you as we wrap up our six-week-long series Uh, through the journey called Generous Justice. And it has been our prayer as your pastors that over these last six weeks, um, you have both heard about what you've already experienced as you have experienced the justice that God gives to us, but also that we would be inspired as the church and as individual Christians to be generous to those around us, especially when it comes to administering the justice that God has given to us. And so, um, as we wrap up this week, kind of the key word in today's uh, sermon is the idea of unity and justice and how those things uh, go together. So, a little while ago, Austin read our first reading, which was Psalm 133, and it starts off with this beautiful sentence, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Now, uh, David is talking about people, but think about the brothers that you know. Uh, Maybe you have siblings, or maybe you're a parent of siblings, and I can tell you that uh, as a dad of three boys, uh, ranging from age uh, seven all the way up to preteen, when they are dwelling together in unity, it is a beautiful thing, right? When there is no arguing, and there is no fighting, and there is simply uh, quiet, or even day of days, laughter coming from the other room as they entertain each other. Um, Imagine what that does to our God who created us all when he hears us as his people uh, living together and singing together in unity. This is a picture that we have um, from Scripture. Now, um, he goes on in that psalm, King David does, to illustrate how God's blessings totally overflow. Um, He talks first about uh, this, this imagery that, is, that seems really unfamiliar to us because we don't anoint people anymore. Um, 
So uh, it says, it is like the oil running down on the head, running down Aaron's beard all the way to the collar of his shirt. Um, That is an imagery that we don't really see much in our culture. Um, But the idea would be that Aaron, when he was called to be a priest, and when he was set aside for his priesthood, uh, he would have been anointed on the head with oil and marked out as one chosen by God. But in this psalm, we have this picture that the oil that anointed him overflows. And commentators will say to us that that this is pointing to the idea that God's blessing and God's anointing isn't just for Aaron, isn't just for the priest, but it overflows in the lives of all of God's people. uh, That we would all carry out our role as uh, people who carry Jesus wherever we happen to go. And then uh, he talks about two mountains, King David does. He says it's like the dew of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is the tallest mountain in Israel. And apparently, uh, it was well known to have uh, dew-covered grass uh, in the early morning, such that it was a feature that is named over and over and over again in Scripture. And that even its fertile nature would be brought to Mount Zion, which is where God's people Uh, worshipped him and where the temple was, but it wasn't really a mountain to speak of. It was just a mountain that God picked. It wasn't the biggest one. It was just a regular one. And here we have this picture again um, that in God's justice, in his economy of justice, um, the highest mountain and the regular old little mountain received the same blessing, the same fertility, the same um, power through him, that his blessings overflow to us all. Um, when we talk about unity, something that goes along with unity that is very, very tightly related to unity is this idea of equality. Right? We want to be unified together and we want to be um, seen as equally valued. And when we talk about unity as it relates to justice in our world today, uh, we would unify against evil and we would unify for good. Um, and some of that works out really, really well. And some of it, we need to realize, is just always going to be at least a little bit broken. That in our efforts to unify with other people, there's really one place that we have to go. And this is pointed at over and over and over again in Scripture. And this should shape the way that you and I um, think as Christians, the way that you and I speak as Christians. That, that true unity... And the truest justice that we will ever find is only found at the cross of Christ. There's, a, there's an old hymn that then got turned into like a bluegrass song and it, there's like a gospel version of it. But there's a line in this old hymn that says, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That that is the only place where we can clearly see that we are all the same. That we all have the same Status because at the foot of the cross, racial divides go away as Jesus' blood covers us all, and and economic divides they go away because we all have the same riches and the same inheritance through our Lord Jesus Christ. And everything that would divide us is taken away from us there because it was hung on the back of Jesus as he bore all of our sin and as he killed it there on his cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And so for you and I as Christians, our life becomes this idea of going away from the cross, but with its image emblazoned in our minds and burned into our hearts so that it would shape the way that we think and the way that we speak and the way that we act and the way that we interact with others. Because at the cross, we just don't have unity with Jesus, but we have unity with all other people. Because he has made us equal there. We are his beloved children. People whom he thought it was worth to die for. And so you and I, as we leave the cross, we bring the cross of Jesus everywhere we go in this world so that it would do its work. It would do its work as we look at the cross and we see the price of our sin and the price of our brokenness and what it cost our God to make us right with Him. And it would do its work when we look at the cross and we know the cost that Jesus paid 
and we rejoice in the fact that He paid it, knowing that I don't deserve it, and knowing that you don't deserve it. And that in that moment, when we focus upon the cross, we see the cost of our sin and the cost of our shame and the cost of our brokenness. We see it wiped clean and we recognize what Jesus has done for us and we see Him pick us up off of our knees and stand us up tall and proud. This is the work of the cross. And as we bring it out with us into the world, wherever we go as Christians, bearing its mark on our head and on our heart, we see Jesus continue to do His work of redeeming. Of bringing to life that which is broken. Of speaking justice into places where there are injustices. Fixing systems that have long been broken. And replacing them with what He calls justice. And what He calls truth. And seeing that that across cultural lines, across uh, racial lines, across economic lines, we are united in a way that we cannot be divided. Because Jesus is the one who has brought us together. So dear friends, uh, that is half of our life, is as we walk from the cross, having been changed by it, having been marked by its work, we bring the cross wherever we go so that we would see the work of Jesus continue in our homes and in our communities. And then the other half of our life is that as we come back to the cross, we would bring with us people from every nation, tribe, and tongue so that they too would be brought to this level ground where we are equal in the eyes of our just and loving God. The other passage that Austin read a little bit ago, um, it's from near the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25. And in this, Jesus is telling a story about Judgment Day, and he lays this picture out, and he uses imagery that's very, very familiar to the people of his day. Um, often, a shepherd would have a mixed herd. So if you were a shepherd, it doesn't just mean you had sheep, it means you probably also had goats with you. And when you came uh, to market and you brought them all in together, uh, you would separate them out because uh, sheep would be used for certain things and goats would be used for certain things, right? It just makes sense. That's how it is. And so Jesus is telling this story about Judgment Day, and, and here's what he says. He says that when he separates the sheep and the goats, those who are faithful to him and those who have not yet been faithful to him, he separates them out, and then he has a conversation with those who are his sheep. And he says to them um, that you saw me when I was poor and you fed me when I was hungry. And you gave me something to drink when I was thirsty and you visited me in jail and you took care of me when I was sick. And that those who follow Jesus would simply say to him, yeah, when did I do that? When did I do that? And Jesus gives us this phrase that is it's famous. Maybe you already know this phrase. He says, whatever you have done for the least of these my brothers, you have done for me. You see, for the Christian, whenever we look at people, we see Jesus everywhere. Because the cross has marked our heads and it has marked our hearts and it has changed who we are so that when we look around, we see Jesus Everywhere, we see Jesus in the face of every person, whether they know his name or not, whether they see his face or not. And you and I as Christians are called to go out into the world and to carry the justice that Jesus brings to us so that if somebody needs food, we would give it to them. If somebody is thirsty, we would quench their thirst. If somebody is naked, we would clothe them. If somebody is imprisoned because of their own choices in the world today and the way that justice has been administered today, we would visit them at their lowest possible point and let them know that they aren't ever truly alone because Jesus hasn't abandoned them and neither shall we. And in these moments when you and I are called to go out into the world both to those that are part of the household of faith that we would call fellow Christians and brothers in Christ, and those who are not yet part of the household of faith, who have nothing to do with Jesus and want nothing to do with Jesus, that we would treat them equally. Because we all have the same need. 
And yeah, our needs include food and water and shelter and love. But beyond that, all of those needs, when they are met by somebody who proclaims the name of Jesus, open the door that someone would have their truest need met. That for the person who receives a gift without cost, something that they know that they had really uh, no part in earning, but that they just received it as a gift and their need was met, they then have a picture of what it means that Jesus would come to them and say, I love you and you're mine. And dear brothers and sisters, this is our work in the world today. That we would be about doing social ministry. That we would be about supporting those who are missionaries out in the world today. That we would be about supporting those who carry the gospel with them wherever they go. Into new places and new communities so that people who speak languages the Bible isn't even written in yet would hear the name of Jesus and learn it and proclaim it and rejoice in it. This is our work in the world, for we are the church. And dear brothers and sisters, uh, this work continues for us all the way until the day that Jesus stands upon this earth again. When He would bring His true justice to this earth, that it would be the law of the land. Until that day, We can only glimpse what God has for us. We can only glimpse the unity that we have in Christ. We can only glimpse the justice that is ours in Him. But as we proclaim His love with our words and with our actions, and as we um, find brokenness in our world, and as we seek to fix it and address it, Jesus is at work. And may we rejoice and the work that He is doing in each one of us each and every day as we daily stand before His cross. But may we also rejoice in the work that He is doing through us as He redeems a broken world through the generous justice of His people. My dear friends, I invite you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, we come to You today and we recognize our brokenness and we thank you that you have redeemed us anyway. We thank you for your cross that you have died for us, that you have poured out your blood for us, that you have risen again for us, that we would have life in you. And dear Jesus, we ask you that your justice would reign in our hearts, that we would seek unity with all people, Because that is what you desire. You desire all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so, Lord Jesus, use us as your people to proclaim you to the nations. Lord Jesus, do your work in us. May your kingdom come in us and through us this day and every day. Amen. So as we uh, depart today, just a couple of announcements for you. The first one is um, those devotional books that the pastors write for all the different sermon series. They used to be released every year. Uh, We've gone away from that, and we were releasing them quarterly now. Um, So the next one will be available online November the 1st. Um, You can download the PDF and print it if you need to. Uh, If you absolutely need a printed copy, you can call the church office and make arrangements for that. we are going to have a special prayer service on November the 2nd, the night before uh, the election. And so one of the things we're going to be praying about, obviously, is the election. But also, um, Pastor Keith is taking prayer requests through the church website right now. Um, So you can go on the website and make a prayer request there, and he'll pray over that in the worship service. It's going to be at 6.30 that Monday night. It will be live in person in the sanctuary. Uh, We're also working on a live online version as well, utilizing Zoom, and so uh, details will come out very, very quickly on how to get hooked up with that if um, you need to be online for that. Um, Part of that is we only have 100 spots available through Zoom, 
Um, so we'll get, uh, we'll get details on how to register for that, but stay tuned for that. And then uh, the Reverend Dr. Greg Seltz. Uh, he went all the way through seminary with Pastor Keith. They played on the basketball team together. He's now um, the leader of the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty in Washington, D.C., um, and he will be here with us on the weekend of November the 21st and 2nd. He'll be preaching the sermon, so you'll see him there. Um, but he'll also be leading a workshop after the Packer game on Sunday. So we're going to start it at 4 o'clock, so we have plenty of time to get back up here um, on the 22nd. And he's going to be talking about this idea that we have in our Lutheran theology and tradition about what it means to walk as citizens in two kingdoms. So we have the citizen... Uh, of heaven, which we all are as Christians, but we also have citizenship here on earth. And how do those two things interact um, according to Scripture? And so uh, Greg is an expert on that, and he will be leading us through those discussions those days. Um, as you prepare uh, to depart for your week, uh, receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace now and always. Amen. Have a great week in the Lord.